Well, this morning we get in the book of John. You know, all said, it didn't take humanity too long to really introduce darkness into the world. Uh, Adam and Eve kind of cracked that egg uh, right at the beginning. Uh, Cain went and uh, murdered his brother, and that was only two generations in. Well, it didn't take very long at all until all of humanity was so despicable that God said, you know, I have to cleanse all of this with a flood. And he basically cleansed everything. However, because some of humanity remained in, through Noah and his lineage, thus the darkness continued to creep in through our nature. And I think it's safe to say that things aren't getting progressively better on that account. Despite what erudite and scholarly humanists, and even sometimes the man on the streets will tell you, and what they'd have you believe, humanity continues to spiral down deeper and deeper into newer and more innovative ways to degrade itself. I don't know if you've noticed that, but I have. All the while, they, seem, they, they try to defend its actions as cultural advancement and its admitted failures as just anomalies. The so-called Enlightenment age has shown itself again and again to fail to bring true enlightenment. Why is that? Instead, it oftentimes simply just tears down any protections that are currently in place from the darkness of humanity, once again finding new places to rear its ugly head. And it's taking its toll across society. I really would say that. The family unit has become what Franklin Graham calls completely unrecognizable. And the freedoms praised and proffered by the sexual revolution have served more capably to pave the way for increasing slavery and captivity. Kids are more vulnerable than ever in their schools and more susceptible to depression than ever before. In short, the world has thrown aside its moral compass in the name of freedom and continues to willingly take upon itself instead the cloak of darkness all the while with this unbelievable naivete about it. I don't know if you've noticed that. This unbelievable naivete wondering why human enlightenment keeps breaking down like a 1970s pinto. <laughs> and I'm not getting my thing to work. I think it's, it's not working anymore. So we may have to turn that off. We'll see. So how does God's word speak to this? And how does it help us? I'm going to try this one more time, see if I can get this to work. It's not flipping. It's, I've got it here, but okay, oh well. All right, let's give it a second. Before we jump into, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would uh, help to enlighten our souls with your word, that you would uh, take this text and bring it to us, and bring it to us in a fresh way that we would understand it and understand what you are speaking to our hearts now, Lord. For we do not want to go here, go away here just knowing more. We want to go here, go away from here being more and understanding more about you, understanding more about ourselves and our relationship to you. Lord, I pray that we would be transformed through the reading of your word. And Lord, if I, pray, I pray that if I say something amiss, that it would come to nothing. And if I miss something, that it would come to the hearts and minds of everyone here through your Holy Spirit, nevertheless. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, it's working. That was probably my fault. I probably messed something up. They fixed it, though. Our sermon series, just to kind of recap a little bit, part one of, of the coming King of Here, which is our, our Advent series, we talked about the imminence of Christ, his, his soon coming, that he was coming. He'd been 400 years, and then he, and then he was coming. And then we talked about his, the eminence of Christ and his kingship as your eminence, his kingship of Christ. And then we talked about the imminence of of Christ. And the imminence being the opposite of transcendence, that God with us, he is here with us, not just above and beyond, but here with us in a special way. In part four here, we're going to talk about the emanation of Christ. There is no such word as the emanations, so I, it would have been really nice if all four of those had matched, but I didn't want to make up words, uh, not in the first year of being here. Anyways, so... <laughs> The emanation of Christ. And what I mean by the emanation, to emanate means to give off. So it's like the sun emanates sunlight. It, it gives off light. It gives, it shines forth. And so we're talking about the emanation of Christ today. But let's jump into the text here. John 1, 4. 
The text tells us about how God addresses this darkness I was talking about, this darkness of humanity. Verse 4 says, In him was life. And this is important for a few reasons. Of course, it's talking about Jesus here. In him was life. It's important for a few reasons. First of all, Christ as part of the Godhead, Godhead is the creator of life. And thus, he has life in him. Christ has life in him. Colossians 1 points out, in him all things hold together. As humans, a lot of times we, we think we can create life, but you know what? We really can't create life. The best we can do is just take that which exists already and create life from that. But Jesus has life within him. He can both create and destroy. And when he creates, he can create life where there was none before. And the second thing is he, he can create, Christ has life in him, but more importantly, perhaps, is that this life is what, or, I'm sorry, is what this life meant to humanity. Verse 4 continues on. It says, for this life was the light of all mankind. See, Christ brings life to us. He brings it to us. The life of Jesus was not kept within himself, but it was brought to mankind as a light to our darkness. He was sharing his life as a light to a world that had chosen darkness. So let's talk about that for a few minutes. Let's talk about what light is and how light functions. First of all, light functions in a lot of different ways, but I'm going to key on three that kind of pertain to our, our verse here. Three ways. Light, first of all, reveals. Light reveals. It grows, and thirdly, it guides. It reveals, it grows, and it guides. So let's talk about what, how light reveals, right? Light reveals. When we say it reveals, what is it revealing? It's revealing truth, the truth about something. It's showing things as they actually are, um, you know, if, if, you, if you see something, when, when light goes in on that, you're going to be able to see more about it. You're going to be able to see, you've probably experienced something like this in your lifetime. I don't know if you've ever had this happen, but sometimes you're, you're putting on your clothes or an outfit or something that you think seems seem to match in a dimmer light, and then you finally realize when you get out in the bright light that the pants you thought were black were actually navy blue or something like that. Not that that's ever happened to me. Uh, but you get out there, point is, is that when you get into that bright light, that bright light can, can reveal details that were unseen in the darkness. And you know what? The opposite is really true of that, too. That darkness hides and, and, and makes it harder to see those imperfections and the impurities, which explains why the Bible describes men as choosing darkness not because it's superior in their eyes, but because it hides what they already know consciously or subconsciously to be true about their own behavior. As Jesus says in John 3, 20, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. So it, the light reveals. And Christ brings light to all mankind, revealing not only who we are and how we are living, but also the nature of the light bringer himself, and that Jesus' purity and life outshines that of men. So light reveals. And the second way light functions is it functions to grow. It grows. What I mean by this, I, I'm not an expert in biology or chemistry, so if I misstate this a little bit, forgive me. If you're a biochemist out there, you know, you're way beyond me. But as I understand it, when we consume food, the sugars that we have in the food that we take in are really just a complicated process of bonding, of plants bonding together water and carbon dioxide uh, through the process of photosynthesis to make these sugars, such that in a sense, what we consume is essentially power from the light from the sun, which kind of makes me sound like a bit of a hippie. I'm not eating sunlight, man! You know? <laughs> But it's really true, and, and light also has another aspect of it. It's inherently life-giving. Light is inherently life-giving. And similarly, in a real spiritual sense, the light of the true Son of God both nourishes us and grows us when we eat and drink it in. So light functions to reveal and to grow, but also functions, thirdly, it guides it guides. Jesus tells us later in the gospel in John 8, 12, that he is the light of the world, and if we follow him, we will not, be in, not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. 
He guides us into ways of righteousness and leads us down the wise path, both from a perspective of our current time frame as well as our eternal life. So light serves to reveal and to grow and to guide. And this is great news indeed. For Christ came into the world as light, and this light brings us life. Light to reveal, light to grow, and light to guide us. When the darkness of the world strangles our lives and saps our energy, as it often does, we are reminded that Jesus has brought us life. We no longer only have a few choices of a dim path or a dark path, but by turning and following Jesus, we have a lamp unto our feet to guide us along a narrow path that we could not see nor navigate on our own. And he will be faithful to strengthen us and protect us from the evil one, as 2 Thessalonians 3.3 tells us. But our passage tells us one other aspect, one important truth about life. Not about how it functions, but in its destiny. In verse 5, John 1, verse 5, the light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. I think it's easy to just read across that and miss the truth that it's telling us. And, you know, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about this imagery, and I thought, you know, it's easy for us to imagine the light of Jesus as, a, as kind of a candle, just flickering in the wind in an open night sky. And if we can just somehow face the torrents and the winds and keep heading towards that light, and somehow we can find truth. And yet, you know what? That's more of a humanistic way of understanding truth. This idea that truth has to be sought out hard and far, that you have to climb to the highest peak and be, meet some wise man who contemplated his navel for five years and figured out truth. And that somehow you've got to go and find truth. That's a humanistic way of doing that, of looking at it. Yet the, the, way the Bible shows us is very different. The picture here is much more different. Jesus does not bring a light that is soft and diffused, but a light that shines brightly in the darkness. Not a candle in the night sky, but a spotlight in a broom closet. And I use that imagery, the idea, something really, really bright that's made to be able to shine everywhere. And yet, in such a small space, it shines so brightly, it reveals all. Filling the darkness, revealing everything. And it's easy to see for those who are willing to keep their eyes open and gaze into its brightness. Do you see what I'm saying there? It's not so much that this light is somehow how, how hidden. It's the fact that the light is there and we choose not to look at it. So we need to, of course, do that. Let's look at this from another way. There's a Scottish proverb that says, and I won't try my Scottish accent this morning, but uh, daylight will peep through a little hole. Daylight will peep through a little hole. And what does it mean by that? Well, obviously it's a proverb, so it could mean a lot of different things, and it's not a biblical proverb, so I don't have a lot of background on that. However, if you've ever had the experience, as I have, being in like a dark room, when bright light peeks through them, it immediately starts to fill up the room. But you know what? The contrary, if you've ever thought about it, is not true. If you stand in a bright room and you open a dark closet, what happens? The closet starts to get lit up. It doesn't bring darkness into the room. My point is that the light of Christ is not overcome by darkness, and therefore we need to continue to tap into the source of all light because Christ brings light into the world. And when he brings truth, that life can't be unshown. The darkness has not overcome it. And when we say that, we may say, find ourselves sometimes saying that darkness is winning. We talk, we, we use those sorts of words, that darkness. I even kind of at the beginning said there's a lot of darkness in the world. But you know what? When we talk about darkness winning, so to speak, it is more because the choice of mankind toward darkness and away from, that, that mankind bends more towards reaching to darkness and away from the light. But the light of Christ always shines brighter, always remains stronger. And it is this light that gives and fosters life. So what did Christ's coming, oopsie, went too far. What did Christ's coming to bring to mankind that, that we didn't already have? 
What did Christ's coming bring to mankind that it didn't already have? Christ brought the light of the gospel to a darkened world desperately in need of it. That he might reveal the darkness around us and within us to grow us and to guide us. You know what? This is glorious to know. And we rejoice in the, in the reality of it. But what exactly does this mean for us on kind of a practical level? What does this mean? It's good to be able to know something, but what do we do with that? Well, I'm going to suggest a few things. I have two things that are suggestions today. First of all, I'm going to say we can't control the darkened world around us in a direct way. I don't know if you, a lot of times we think we can, but we really can't. We can't control how dark the world gets in a direct way, only indirectly. But the indirect way that we influence the world around us is through something we can directly affect. And what is that? It's ourselves. We can affect ourselves. So here's a question that I would ask on this first point of what we can do. What darkness might the Lord find in you and in me? What darkness might the Lord find? What are the areas that, that we know of, or perhaps we even need the Lord to uh, make us aware of and reveal to us? Where are those holdout areas of our lives where we refuse to let the Lord in or anyone else see? Of course, the irony being of, that the Lord already sees everything. Well, I want you to try and think of that area of your life now. And if you can't think of any area, think for a little longer. There's probably an area. <laughs> I want you to think of that. And I want you to resolve to let the Lord bring life, bring his life into that dark part of your being as a spotlight in a broom closet. It reveals us and shines through us. So it doesn't just reveal on the outside. It's so bright that it almost kind of goes through us as an x-ray and shows everything within us. And you know, even as children of the light, that is often hard for us to do, to give that over to God. For you know what? We hide our imperfections in shadows, either for guilt or for shame. But realizing that Jesus is both good and wants to bring us abundance in our life is a comfort. So choose light and let him deal with the darkness within us because light repels darkness, not the other way around. So this leads us to the second practical thing that I would suggest for today. When we, the second thing I'd say is when we let Jesus bring more light into our souls, in our being, this light allows us to be a light to those around us. I think of, I'm gonna, it's going to be silly. It's a silly example, but there was a story about a man who committed a crime, and he was entirely cov covered in mirrors. And later he sat down and apologized after he had time to reflect. But I'm bump. Yes, but you'll remember that, won't you? Okay, so I use that illustration because we are supposed to reflect the Lord, not in a condescending way, because the Lord is not condescending, but in a way that Christ brings the light to us through love. And in that way, we don't hide our life under a bushel, but we let our light show because our light is really sourced by not our own humanity, but the source of light itself, Jesus Christ. Our light is that reflection and a result of the light and life of our Lord being our master and him giving that life and light to us. So let me kind of wrap this up. Human enlightenment doesn't bring true and lasting enlightenment because it has a faulty source, humanity. It can't bring true enlightenment because humanity doesn't have it. It can't give it to itself. Instead, we need to look to the true source of light and life, which is Jesus Christ, who our text says brought the light to mankind. So don't fret about the darkness in the world. Certainly we address it, but don't fret about it. Don't worry about it. Just know that God has provided the solution through Jesus Christ, the light of the world, and in, against him darkness cannot stand. Amen? Amen. He is a spotlight in a broom closet. And if we let him, he will reveal to us the darkness within us and help us to grow and guide us into kingdom ways and righteous paths, not to our own glory, but to the glory of God alone. And if we do this, our light will shine into a darkened world as we reflect his light and his life. 
And we need to stay in God's word and keep that darkness from creeping in again on us. Jesus brings life and light to us. So choose that light. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that uh, we would choose light. Not because we look at ourselves as better or smarter or wiser or, or somehow more blessed, but realizing that in the choosing of light, that that's through that blessing, that, or through that choosing, that we are blessed. Lord, I thank you for your light in our lives, even that initial light of your Holy Spirit to open and warm our heart, even to the point where we were to, able to finally look away from the darkness that we were chose and chose and be able to choose you. Lord, I pray that we would continue to choose light and that that light and that choosing would continue to grow within us so brightly that it would reflect to those around us and that they would see and wonder, what is going on over there at Covenant? What is going on with those people? For they love deeply. They have a light in their lives, a joy in their lives, and they rejoice in that light, and I want to have that. Lord, I pray that we could choose you, choose light, and that we would be blessed by turning away from that darkness today and living in the light of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.